Nope. Now, what shape was the modern Greece in back in the 50s when you started scuba diving around it? I mean, was it all sanded up? Yeah, basically it was, but you get a good hard three or four day northeaster in the wintertime, it would uncover it. Now, on the side of it, uh, when the top portion was uh, out of the sand, uh, it had the portholes in there, which, which I guess they were made out of bronze. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were not encrusted with anything. They were perfectly clean, and like the data were put on. And you could unlatch them, open them, <coughs> and it worked fine. And they were still there. I think it was Stanley South that got them to come down. And they were out in front of the monument. Out there behind the breakers, looked like they were scrounging around on the bottom trying to find a cannonball or whatever they could come up with. Drove by and one of them came out of the water and asked him what he was doing. They said they were trying to find relics and mentioned the fact that the modern Greece was up there and he said, what's that? Told him it was a shipwreck, blockade runner, and offered to carry him up there and show him. And he got to the man that was in charge and we went up and looked at it. He said, okay, so we'll put a couple of divers out and see what they can find. They swam off the beach. And the first thing they did when they went down, come back up, almost bloop, about that quick, with rifles in their hand. Why were we surprised? <clears throat> and they were in good shape? Some of them looked like he could almost shoot them. That's how good they were. They had just freshly been pulled out of the sand. The sand had washed off of them. I was 13 at the time and I had taken a job at a hot dog stand. The the Navy guys were renting a hotel room across the street from the hot dog stand and they would come over for lunch or come over for supper once they got diving during the day and they would sit around and tell jokes and stories about diving trips and things and we all become friends at that time. and. Uh, one of them asked me if I'd be interested in going out and seeing what just exactly what they were doing down on the modern Greece, and uh, of course I gladly accepted. For me at 13, it was uh, an adventure at that time. <clears throat> so the next day, we went down uh, to meet them at Fort Fisher, and uh, I was not by myself. There was several other spectators, and I believe a a newspaper crew from out of Raleigh was there as well. Uh, we waited on the beach for the landing craft to come up and pick us up and uh, the front dropped down on it and we all loaded onto the landing craft and uh, proceeded out to the work barge that the Coast Guard had brought in for the divers to work off of. Uh, it was one of those beautiful days. Uh, the sea was just aqua green and almost flat. Um, couldn't ask for better seas to for divers to work in. Uh, once we got there, they, had, they were in a process, when we were docking to the, the barge, they were in the process of hauling up a small cannon. At that time, there were two lifts off the end of the back of the barge, um, which we had them tied off to the cannons, and they were in process of lifting the cannons out of the water when we got there. They were bringing up anchors, uh, they brought up um, lead ingot, ingot bars, uh, extremely heavy, I'd say, 80, 90 pounds a piece, um, thick, made in Liverpool, England, uh, stamped in each bar. Uh, bullets, just buckets of infield bullets, thumbtackers, um, .577 caliber infield bullets, um, uh, mini musket balls. Uh, they were bringing up a few rifles at the time. And I was on the barge one day and uh, one of the EOD divers, that's the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit from uh, Indian Head, Maryland. These are adventurous guys. Nothing scares them. Um, one of them said to me, here, put this tank on. Uh, here, uh, put this thing in your mouth. There was sediment in the water. Uh, and I went down. I was kind of disappointed. I followed him. And the visibility was only about 15 feet. Little did I know that during the entirety of my diving experience, I would never see that clarity again on that wreck or any other wreck. I think some of the same divers that had been involved as vacationing divers came back and uh, tons of stuff literally was brought up. 
um, big packets of tools, all kinds of tools, chisels, hammerheads, files, and uh, sheets of tin, all matted together in one bundle. And uh, typically, the Navy vessel would dock at the Carolina Beach dock, and the stuff would be loaded on a pickup truck and brought to the lab. And we had the problem of how to keep the stuff underwater. We knew, even Al Honeycutt knew, that the items had been in the water for a long time, and so the best thing to do is put them in water until you figure out what to do. So we stored them in whatever tanks we could get, so we had to dig holes in the ground. We got somebody with a backhoe to dig holes in the ground, and we lined it with several thicknesses of heavy uh, plastic. And we put artifacts in those ditches. There are at least two, maybe three of those ditches. The biggest one was probably 15 or 20 feet long, four or five feet wide. Little did we know, when we placed those things there, they, some of them would be there until now. <laughs> uh, at the lab, we learned how to do uh, electrolytic reduction. Uh, we learned how to do electrochemical reduction to remove the uh, corrosion products from the metal objects. And over the years, we honed these methods until we felt comfortable um, talking and writing and publishing about some of them. Back in 1962, people who lived along the ocean and their families had been here for generations, uh, whatever they found in the ocean uh, was theirs, unless it was something that was just recently lost and had not been abandoned by the, the owner. But anything that had been lost and abandoned, they, it was theirs, finders, keepers. And uh, we had to work through that attitude, and, and we did. And people began to bring stuff that they had found to the lab. Myself for the first eight years, and then we had uh, uh, Gordon Watts to come with us uh, after that time. And then the two of us worked together until uh, the mid-early uh, 70s. And when the CETA program gave us help, we actually went back to these tanks again and took each object out and made an inventory and eventually published that inventory in, in a little book. The storage was complicated in the way that we were doing it, and so therefore we decided that we would try to store them on the outside, and we got these larger tanks, and since most of the preservation uh, was accomplished as far as the needs of the museums, we figured we'd store them there until such times that we could get back to them, or someone else might be interested in working with them. We put them in these tanks and we put covers on them, and as time passed, our attention was on the many things that came forward. The environmental review process was something that came, that came later on, uh, taking up more of our time. And it was lack of funding prevented us from being able to really do much more than what we did. So we just we put them in these tanks outside and just let them be stored there. And now that I I see this new interest in coming and and uh, getting them out, back out of there, it's almost like a relief. It's almost like uh, we're getting the help that <laughs> we wish we had years and years ago.